Okay, welcome everybody. Welcome to season three of The Matrix Conversations and Transformations, our seminar series from the Department of Critical Theory and Social Justice in Los Angeles. I'm Malik Moazam Dolat, and I'm joined by the co organizers of the series, uh, Professor Christian Akis and uh, Professor Claire Crawford, who put this ballroom series together. So today we're very excited to be joined by uh, professor, activist, and artist Michael Roberson. Before Professor Crawford introduces us to Michael Roberson, a quick overview of the matrix and what's still coming up in our third season for the rest of the semester. So briefly, the matrix focuses on pressing current events and seeks to connect our community with innovative experts, scholars, and artists, and the most effective activists in the areas of critical theory and social justice. We just completed our indigeneity and settler colonialism series last Thursday with Professor De Leon. Uh, that talk and the video of past all of our past events are on our website and on our YouTube channel. If you want to go back and watch them, there's some great ones. Um, the rest of this third season is organized around three themes, just very briefly, um, fighting white supremacy and global ethnonationalism. We have a, a second small series on technologies of repression and resistance in the Middle East, North Africa, and among Muslim groups. And then there's this series, uh, the ballroom and ballroom culture series. And uh, before we get into it, just a very quick thing. We're running a webinar here rather than a normal Zoom meeting. And that means you can submit your questions through the Q&A button that is right there at the bottom of your screen. And um, if you do that, uh, the panelists will be able to see the question and we'll be able to answer them, okay? Um, and when they're, when they're uh, picked for uh, being answered, they'll, they'll show up for everyone to see, okay? So thank you very much. And with that, Professor Crawford. Hello, it is my pleasure to introduce our guest for today. Michael Roberson is a health practitioner, advocate, activist, artist, curator, and leader within the LGBTQ community. He is the co-creator of the nation's only Black gay research group and National Black Gay Men's Advocacy Coalition, as well as an adjunct professor at the New School University slash uh, Lane College NYC and Union Theological Seminary in New York as well. He is an international art and politics consultant and a member of the International Sound Art Collective entitled Ultra Red. Michael is a scholar in residence for the Center for Race, Religion, and Economic Democracy, as well he has done a, a recent TED media residency where he performed a global TED talk about the underground Black Latinx house ballroom community entitled The Enduring Legacy of Ballroom. Michael also serves as a cultural consultant for the Pose FX television series. Additionally, he is a public health advisor and community engagement specialist for the NYC COVID-19 contract tracing initiative. So how are you doing, Michael? You can just kind of like jump in. I know we uh, talked about a little bit, you know, even though I read your bio, like, who are you? How you be? How did you come to ballroom? What is your connection there? So first and foremost, I'm utterly, utterly blessed, right? I, you know, the thing I'm always responding to when people ask me, first of all, I love your language, how you be. But when people when ask me that question and what it really means to be blessed. And so I am utterly blessed to be in this dialogue. I'm utterly blessed to be in this space with you all. And I just got off another sort of webinar that sort of began with that question around who am I and how did I find myself not only a member, but a lover of the Housewell Barman community? And I'm going to begin in my Cornell West way, right? That I am because my mother, I always begin with how I theologize what it meant to come through the womb of my mother, that black woman. And I will never not be in a space where I don't lift up black women in a certain kind of way. Um, because if not for black women, there is no Michael Robbs. I'm very clear about that. And so, but in this womb of my mother, I theologized that that God or the universe had my that had the very first conversation with me and implanted in in the, the truth of who I was in the very DNA of myself. So that when I came out to the world, out of my mother's womb, or out to the world around the intersection of my blackness and gayness, that when the world began to tell me very differently about who I was, that the DNA and the cells in the DNA told me, my cells told me, don't believe the lie. Um, when I was younger, this is the honest truth, and I said this had this conversation with you. When I was younger, my construction of cosmology was not father, 
Son, Holy Ghost. It literally was my mother, God, then Jesus. I'm four or five years old believing my mother was my mother, God was my father, and Jesus was my very best friend. Ergo, for me, that meant Black women, God, then Jesus. And as I've gotten older, folks have asked me, have I shifted that sort of construction? And I said, no, to this day, it's the same thing. So I am who I am because Black women have always loved me and 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 held on to me and nurtured me. I've been a member, I'm originally from Camden, New Jersey, which is a small inner city across the bridge from Philadelphia. And my trajectory about Camden, I can say this because I'm from there, is that is hood hood, right? I created that word, you can't get any hooder. The Camden, the Camden and Detroit and Baltimore are very similar cities. Um, I went to school there, went to Rutgers, graduated from there, applied to their law school twice and got accepted but put on a waiting list. And then I got tired of waiting. So I began working for the Camden City Board of Education as a crisis counselor. And then at part time, I was doing psychiatric emergency services in two hospitals. And then I began facilitating a youth support discussion group for LGBT young folk of color at a black gay organization called Colors in Philadelphia. Then I started going to graduate school, trying to get this master's in education, but it was me, it, it was in, in many ways, um, more so the facilitation of the youth group that changed my trajectory. And I began hating my job, nothing that my job did at the Board of Education. But the blessed thing about working for the Board of Education in the Northeast is that when we have bad weather, when the snow's bad, you know you don't have to go to work. And so when the weatherman will forecast snow and I will wake up in the morning and there was no snow, I started getting mad at God. So I said, no, something has to change. This is my true story. May 1999, I'm sitting home, listening to Maxwell, who was my favorite artist. And I heard a voice say to me, you need to move to New York City and do the work you want to do with LGBT young folk. Two months later, July, I put in my resignation with the Board of Education. And two months later, September 99, I moved to New York City with $177 worth of change, I promise you. I've been there ever since. I was blessed enough to, to not only hone in the work around public health um, in relation to HIV prevention and the larger Black and Latino LGBT community, but particularly because I was a member of the house ball community. I've been a member of the house ball community for um, some now 27 years. Um, and I've been blessed to do some things. Last thing I'll say about this, I know we'll get back to that. You know, um, this, this thing about who I be, right? Um, in 2008, I got fired from my job in a very public and painful way, absolutely painful. The great Greek philosopher Montaigne says the philosophy is about learning how to die. But if a philosophy is about learning how to die, then theology was about a rebirth. So in this space of death and being reborn, I wanted to put public health in conversation with theology because it was my assertion that the theological abomination narrative had direct impact on health disparities impacting Black gay men. You tell a folk that the very essence of their being, of their breathing, is antithetical to God. And we have all of these um, uh, 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 institutions we deem necessary for human growth, church, school, family, community that repeats the same message. And then I see same people to engage in protective factors over body that they've been told is no good to God didn't make sense to me. And I wanted to shift that narrative and I was blessed to go to union, did a couple of degrees there, but it was in my relationship to not only black liberation theology of Dr. James Cone, but womanist theology that was created in 1985 by black women that really expanded the way that I wanted to do this work. Um, so we'll, we could talk further about those things. Thank you for uh, like starting us off here. I know something that we talked about and what became the title for today's talk is can we talk more about ballroom, a black prophetic fire, the black church rebirth of a nation? Yeah, you know, so I, you know, let me tell you something. I'm a Pisces Aquarius. And so my Aquarius can, can connect dots and I can, I'll rearrange something and it'll be the same lecture. So usually when I talk about ballroom community, I will call it two things, right? Either um, the trans sounds of black freedom. And we're gonna talk about that even in this notion of black prophetic fire or ballroom has something to say. And I'll talk about that later and why that reemerged, that, that emerged for me. But I was thinking about, of course, I am, a, I was blessed enough at Union to have Cornel West as a professor. As you can see, I try to do his performativity. Um, and, uh, but was so impacted by not a lot of his work, but his book, 
um, the Black prophetic fire as he chronicled or articulated it through six towering figures, which was um, uh, uh, Frederick Douglass, W.E.B. Du Bois, Ida B. Wells, Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, and Ella Baker, and what it meant, this tradition of Black folk, right, a prophecy, not only having the ability to look onward, even in, to imagine onward, even when reality says very different, but like Du Bois says, that can, that can that have a third sight because of their marginalization position. And I looked at ballroom coming out of that sort of tradition. It's history, it's cultural productions, it's theological and political formulations, but having the desire for me to go back to Sankofa, right? To go back and excavate a history that even in the tradition of black prophetic fire, there's hegemony that does not talk about it, that won't deal with its, is discomfort and disability to address issues around sexuality and freedom. It to me, and I'll go back to that, it is it's one of the most counterintuitive thing to think that you can struggle for black freedom and oppress your black people. Okay. In the law of quantum mechanics, that just doesn't work. Right. Right. So so should we start then, uh, I guess, with thinking about black folks and queerness and and just like the church relationship, like, like how do you how do you like pull that back together, right? Since we know a lot of times queer folks kind of get particularly Christianity, move away from Christianity. And so how do we how do we come back to this and seeing ourselves as black queer folks in the church and seeing the spaces that we already exist in that are predominantly queer as church? So to your wonderful point, I when I talk about church, of course it has a resonance of Christianity and I am utterly not meaning it, but intentionally of speaking it because I know that it elicits a lot of things, some dialectical tensions, right? Um, but when I think about church, I put it in conversation with one of the premier scholars about, around the black radical aesthetic tradition, Fred Motwin, around mm -hmm. his notion of the black radical aesthetic tradition. And that church goes beyond this notion of Chris being Christian. I think that we have done a disservice around the, our ontology of blackness in relationship to global oppression, particularly around the transatlantic slave trade, right? And so what I'm thinking about Black church, it is including Black Christian church spaces. Mm -hmm. It is in many ways, to some degree, it's foundational to some degree, but it's expanding on it. This, I don't know if you saw, was it last week? It was last week. Last week, yep. Ah, the wonderful documentary that Henry Louis Gates did on the Black church. Now, normally, I'm I have a critique because I love Henry Louis Gates, but he oftentimes plays safe. But him to start with, to some degree, the, the, the African traditional religious um, experience prior to Christianity and talked of Yoruba and voodoo, but in some ways in, he didn't end here, but wind up to Sylvester was brilliant, was absolutely brilliant. And I'm sitting there and, I'm, and I started tearing up because I'm, to be in close proximity to some of those people. So Cornel West was in it, Dr. Ebony Marshall Terman, who we'll talk about a little later, who's a woman, a scholar was in it, Bishop Yvette Flunder, who's a black lesbian who was in it, and all these wonderful folk to really talk about this notion of church, but how we've created church spaces outside of tr the tradition of church. Mm -hmm. So one of the places I think about, let me back into that, you know, when I talk about sort of the history of the house ball community, you know, one of the things I, 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 I sort of situate this if not, right? If not for slavery, if not for the Emancipation Proclamation, if not for the creation of Black Reconstruction and its dismantle, if not for the raise of Jim and Jane Crow racism and lynching, if not for Black folk migrating out of the Southern part of the United States, looking for new spaces of freedom and Harlem becoming the new Black Mecca, right? Mm -hmm. If not for the creation between 1919, for the most part, 1931, this art political, uh, artistic political movement called the Harlem Renaissance, right? If not for the Black church in that space, creating a three decade campaign to get rid of Black queers out of Harlem. There were three ways that Black queers congregated in beauty salons, at rent parties or having rent parties and drag balls. And drag balls become the largest space. And I oftentimes say that in that sense then, in contestation to the black church, 
the drag balls first and foremost is a black trans womanist theological discourse because it creates itself one as a critique. How dare we come to this space and create new spaces of freedom, but I'm at a new home for freedom, but we're homeless in our new home. And so we have to then create something for us that, th that theologizes our mattering. Right, the theologies are mattering. And so, and of course we didn't have a language, a category called trans then necessarily. Uh, we, we said drag ball because we said gay men who went up in drag. And so for me, uh, when I speak about house ball, that in and of itself, it becomes that space. But you can, you can sort of uh, historicize that when you think about plantation and the creation of praise houses, these small houses where houses, Catch it, the small house that was constructed on the plantation where slaves could go worship for the most part. They were small intentionally so that you wouldn't have a whole bunch of folks congregating and this, this possibility of uprising. Um, and so, and which winds up after, after the Emancipation Proclamation becoming the structures of black church. When well, you think about the same thing of balls in the space a Harlem where we're supposed to have been free, we became not free again. And you find, you go to this performative space, yes, but a house, I call it a praise house, where these black queers were able to, to worship. And to me, and I had the same, we could talk a little later, I had the same chronology around black gay clubs and what that meant uh, in the same way. Can we get in more to thinking about the Black trans womanist theological discourse? I know that's something <laughs> that you that you like to talk about. I know we talked a lot about when we spoke one on one, thinking about womanist Black womanist theology, particularly as being just grounding. And I think you said something that I that stuck with me since the weekend about uh, us witnessing over and over again Black women <laughs> dying, right? Like, like, and how that is something. That, that we see versus that of possibly, you know, our religious thinking of Jesus on the cross, right? We, we theorize around that, I think you said. And so, but we see black women. That's right. Yeah. So, so we, we theorize it and we imagine mm -hmm. Jesus down the cross because we weren't there. Now, right. some of us believe that we had a dream and that makes us there, but we were not there. But Zora Neale Hurston, Neil Hurston said, of course, African-American Harlem Renaissance writer once said that black women are the mules of the earth. Always, some nuance in her now, always trampled on over and over and over and over again. I oftentimes say that black women, fortunately to some people, unfortunately to others, are situated as the Christ. You're nailed to the cross sacrificial lamb, always having to give and to give and to give, even over time to her oppressor's children, holding up whole communities and nothing left for her, nothing after that, asked to do. That even in our freedom movements have been invisible lies. Mm -hmm. So we continue to see uh, um, this, 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 this brutalization of black women or this crucifixion of black women. And so I, never knew that I was thinking that way. Just knew that I witnessed my mother struggling, my sister struggling, but always trying to make a way out of no way. You know, um, knew that when I got to Baltimore community, I saw black trans women continue to die as well as black gay men, um, but being relegated to spectacle performativity while black gay men in our patriarchy gained power, right? So I didn't know I was thinking that way until I went to Union Theological Seminary. And I had Dr. James Cone, um, uh, created one of the creators, founders of Black Liberation Theology, and he talked about womanism a little bit. And I was like, oh, this is interesting. But it was my second year and my second semester that, I've, that I was blessed enough to have as a professor, Dr. Ebony Marshall Terman. And folks who know me and know me well know that she is one of the people who have the biggest impact on the expansion of my conscience. In fact, uh, helped me she gave me a language, womanism gave me a language that helped me codify why I came to seminary. But womanism was created in 1985 by three black women, Dr. Katie Cannon, which is Nick Cannon's aunt, Dr. Uh, Dolores Williams and Dr. Jacqueline Grant. And in many ways they took Alice Walker, 
well, actually it's not Christian, it's a black lesbian Buddhist. Her definition of womanism just opposed, just, just opposing it to feminism and, um, and created a theological critique first, right? The critique was, I lift you up black liberation theology for critiquing Christianity on its racism, but you black men, you're still patriarchal. Could a black church, more black women, but less in power. It lifts up feminist theologies. Ah, I, I applaud you for critiquing Christianity on its patriarchy, but you're white women. You do very little with race and class. And how are you theologically, uh, how's your theological imperative around allowing the suffering to speak when you have black maids? Mm -hmm. And so they then said that a priori, first and foremost, the, the, the stories and the bodies of black women are first and foremost. And it created a theological discourse in response to that. And it's expanded and it has allowed other folks to be able to use its methodology. So it's been great for me. I'm real clear, I'm not a womanist because I'm not a woman, but I, but I have been able to use it as a methodology and a strategy, uh, particularly not only with the, for the lives of black gay men, but more specifically with the house ball community and being able to place black trans women in conversation with cisgendered black women to talk about this constitution of what makes a black woman, right? Um, and and there's, some, um, there's some critique to be made to some degree. Uh, I, I'm not one of those people who um, who shy away from the critique, even as I'm lifting up. Um, and so for me to say, so in that sense, I, that for me is why the ballroom first and foremost is a black trans womanist theological discourse because it lifts up black folk as if we're black and say, bravo that we migrated from the South to the North and find this new place called Harlem and create in many ways a space of home and freedom, but the audacity for you then to say that I don't have the right, the right to be, that it's really around citizenship, that I'm not a citizen in black community, that I'm not a citizen in the black freedom movement. And so that's why I call it that first and foremost. I guess something to follow that up, I know you have also seen you write and heard you talk about black trans women as why is it so important for them to be celebrated then in the ballroom community and the space? So thinking of them as divine creatures and part of it, like like pulling together these worlds and not just like how they exist outside of the ball space, but, but like why walking, why being celebrated is so key in thinking about spirituality and how they get even more pushed. I guess like this no citizen gets even more pushed, but then um, put back into place like what is it about ball that is able to to do this uh, like how do I guess I'm thinking how do folks come to the space that makes it divine that makes it uh, a spiritual place well I so I so I would never say that ballroom is unique in that mm -hmm. I just it but black folk in many ways is unique not unique over right but unique in the way that we do it so ballroom's black and of course, it's largely Black Latino, but Barbara's construction is it's cultural production. It's Black. It's ontology is Black. So that's part of being Black, right? right. Um, and so why is it important to lift up Black trans women? Because it's important to lift up Black women. Mm. And so I, you know, and I think it's in some in some space, as you know, it is in, it is important to, depending upon who you are, to make this distinction between, you know, being a cisgender experience and being a trans experience. But these are still Black women. Mm -hmm the through line. So black trans women get beat and brutalized because they're trans, but also because they're black women. Because black women get beat and brutalized, let's be real clear. And so it's so important to have that dialogue, but particularly in the house ball community, it was created by them. You think about that, talked about the Harlem Renaissance and its relationship to drag ball and the construction of drag ball, but it migrated out after World War II where other cities become blacker, DC, Detroit, Philadelphia, and Baltimore, um, and Detroit. And so just like black freedom movements migrated across the country, these drag balls migrate across the country in confronting white supremacy, and I call it black homophobia, I'm gonna get back to that because someone pushed me on that, black homophobia, um, but trans new spaces of freedom. 1967, particularly a black trans woman named Chrysalabasia, 
who resisted sort of racism in the pageant drag ball circuit is a wonderful uh, video on YouTube that sort of chronicles that called the legendary uh, crystal. And she, she resisted racism. She walks off stage, thinks she should have won. And in many ways was tired because it felt like always white trans women. I want this also color on lighter skin trans women were winning. Um, and so there's a guy named Phil Black who was the only African-American drag performer who had a Screen Actors Guild card in many ways whispered in her ear and said, we should go back to an old Harlem drag ball circuit since this is happening and we'll have a ball and name it after you. And so you saw from 67, 1968, the very first house was Great House of La Beja. So here's a morphing from drag ball, drag ball only because trans women participated to house ball, the construction of a political and theological praise house, if you will where you had mother and children. So the house was named these famous trans women. And then in 1973, the very first gay man walked the ball. So from 67 to 73, you saw the morphing from drag ball mm -hmm. to house ball. Why I give you all of that to say why it's so important to lift them up? Because if you went to a ball today, you would never know that trans women created this. Because black gay men have um, a disability, it says disability to interrogate our patriarchy. Somehow we think that because we're black and gay that eradicates us from being in privileged spaces. Mm -hmm. um, and so you go to a ball, the politics, the, all, the, all of the formulations, cultural formulations, all that other stuff is as black gay men have owned and usurped and relegated black trans women to some degree as the spectacle. There's not a sharing of power um, and so it's always important to lift those stories up. Um, there's a, 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 a trans woman named Tracy Africa Norman, who is a iconic trans woman. Mm -hmm. She was also a model who in 1977 was in Vogue Italia. Um, she was on the, the Clairol box and then she was outed as a trans woman um, and lost her contract. And she's an icon in the health ball community. And those kinds of stories are so important to lift up, right? It's so, so important to lift up. Partly because younger Black trans women oftentimes don't have access to that history. Mm -hmm. And once that history is gone, when you don't tell your story, someone's going to tell it and they're going to tell it absolutely, utterly wrong. Um, and so that's why a lot of young folk, including young Black gay men, think that ballroom was somehow created during Paris's burning yeah. and that Black gay or Black Latino gay men created it. And that's just absolutely not the case. Yeah. Just to like piggyback off of that, I think I've heard you talk a little bit more about how even in your own lectures, you think of YouTube as a pedagogy particularly <laughs> for recovering uh, the, the origin of Black trans women being the founders and originators of this. So can you speak more to that? So I'll get ready to go somewhere. And <laughs> so um, here's again around the brutalization of a black woman. This is going to seem like a stretched analogy. But just last week, Justin Timberlake, you're like, why am I talking about Justin Timberlake? But Justin Timberlake put out an apology to both Britney Spears and Janet Jackson. Janet Jackson because of the Super Bowl incident and Britney Spears in relationship to his relationship and what happened, what came out in the documentary. Um, and what folks don't know is that, a lot of folks don't know, is that we're able to utilize YouTube because of the Super Bowl incident that literally was created because of this black woman's breast and her and the, the crucifixion of her, right? And so the, the creators of YouTube want to find a way to keep playing a video over and over again because it was such demand. That's how YouTube was created. And TiVo in many ways was expanded. And for Ballroom, it became this space to archive. Because for us, we had these horrible VHS videos, that you know, the cameraman was shaking and all these other things you couldn't watch the thing and so it and so that 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 so YouTube became that space. There's a guy named Caesar who uh, created ballroom throwbacks and initially, you know, he created to archive those old videos, VHSs, and put them on videos, right? Put them so that we can have greater access to it. Um, 
and then he's wind up creating balls or what have you. And so would it allow that allowing, and there's a there's a there's a tension around it as well, but that allowing not only again to your point uh, allows the archival of a, a history to be told and folks to have access, but allows communities around the world to not only create their own hospital community, if you will, expand on it, but to find some solace. Um, in particularly when times are very challenging or what have you. And we saw that and we see that. Um, uh, I have a great person who I call my son named Felix Pimenta. He's in Sao Paulo, Brazil, black Brazilian. And uh, he watched Paris is burning. He chopped it up and began looking for, and he didn't speak English, began looking for some of the members in the house the, uh, Paris is burning and see they're still alive on YouTube and Facebook. Mm found some, and he began having dialogue with folks, again, not speaking English. So he, he had an app to translate. He winds up then creating, winds up trying to learn how to Vogue Old Way from YouTube and teaching Old Way Vogue in Sao Paulo, Brazil, and begin organizing ballroom in Brazil. It's not the first, but begin organizing ballroom in Sao Paulo, Brazil. Here's a freedom movement, absolutely the freedom movement. But if not for that technology, but I'll go further, if not for, again, the sacrifice of a black woman. Mm. That would have never happened, you two, if not for Janet Jackson incident. Let me go off a little bit. Yes, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, the, the piece around Janet Jackson and and the Justin Timberlake again, this this brutalization, the sacrifice of the black woman. So for years, not only did he not apologize to Britney Spears, she said, you know, I, she didn't want to weigh in because she has a relationship with Justin, but didn't apologize to Janet Jackson and his career you know, expanded and hers deteriorated and find out that Les Moonvoice, Moonville, Moonvest of CBS created a Via Viacom, created this campaign to, to blackball her. Now, what I find interesting in this moment is there's sometimes a relationship between the black feminists, oftentimes talk about are white feminists really in solidarity with, with us. And so as soon as he put the apology up, his wife, which I gather she should have, She's supporting him, said, bravo. So his apologies, you know, atoned to him. Bravo, bravo. Now, this is 15, 16 years as black woman has been brutalized. Bravo, bravo. And you had all these other white women saying bravo. And so my critique was around, yeah, I guess, I guess, I guess. But you made the apology to the black woman because people pressured you to apologize to the white woman first, Britney Spears. Let's be clear. Let's be here. And so even 70 years later, again, the black woman continues to be the sacrifice for everybody, everybody. We could talk about last year and the political movement of black women pushing Georgia to be a blue state now and, and, and all of those other things. And so, but yeah. Yeah, no, we can definitely uh, just continue going there. One, because I'm from Georgia, and also because yeah. I study, I study political science. So, so thinking about Stacey Abrams as part of like the sacrifice, right, as continuing on, um, but then also situating how not only I just think in general Black trans folks are left out when oh. we think of the movement, right, and so that's where you get uh, Black Lives Matter, which should be like inclusive of everything, but then you have folks who feel the need to have to say all Black Lives Matter, right? And I know within Houseball, there's also Houseball Lives Matter. Uh, so do you, can you speak to that a little bit more? Yeah, so let, me, so let me back into that in a way that I talk about that. And so I remember, um, what is the gospel singer, Kim, Kim Burrell, when she had, when a video leaked about um, this the sermon she gave around the death of Black LGBT folk. Yeah. And so I remember that conversation. And she went on to say, you know, um, LGBT folk never supported my career. And I'm like, well, who do you think buy? It's nothing but Black sissies, excuse my language, <laughs> buying your music, let's be real clear. But at any rate, and then I remember Nate Parker, mm -hmm. um, who did the movie about Nat Turner. Um, and it was hailed to be that, right? Um, and then the situation came up about him and back in the day and, and the woman that he um, was accused of raping, but he made these remarks allegedly that he would never play the role of a black gay man because it was Hollywood's attempt 
to feminize black men. Then I remember Dave Chappelle making the same remark. But the universe has a way of snapping in people's face using black aesthetics. Um, and so here, all of us started hearing about this little independent film that was only being played at film festivals called Moonlight. Yeah. Out of nowhere. Next thing you know, it's being played in larger theaters. And by the end of the year, it's grand prize at the Golden Globe and then at the Oscars. And then the guy who uh, wins, wins Best Supporting Actor becomes the first Muslim to ever win, right? And so why do I say that? So when it happened, I remember having a conversation with Black, black LGBT folk, but, particular, but also Black folk who, who identify as heterosexual or straight. And I said, you know, the, it's so interesting this thing that we're talking about in terms of Black homophobia. And I call it that. And I'm not at all. Some people say, well, that then subscribes to the notion that that inscribes the notion that Black people are more homophobic than white folk. I said, no, you believe that. And I think the Black LGBT folk shouldn't list, should not uh, uh, necessarily adhere that that's what that means. But I want to particularly situate homophobia in black community as it relates to black people, black LGBT folk, like we situate white supremacy. Let me be real clear. At all, am I, am I not, am I suggesting that black people are more homophobic, but I am saying that I'm talking about black LGBT folk and homophobia in black community um, and its impact. But at any rate, I said, it's very interesting. I had this dialogue around black homophobia um, and black freedom when the most emblematic event around the black struggle for freedom post-slavery was a 1963 March on Washington that was organized by an openly black gay man named Bayard Rustin. Not Martin Luther King, Martin Luther King was the leader, but a black, again, the sacrifice, a black gay man organized it. And the most emblematic event around the black struggle for freedom post the 1963 March on Washington is this moment on Black Lives Matters. And two of the three founders are black queer women. Right? So for the past 50 some odd years, the black struggle for freedom have been situated through black queer folk. And so it, in the law of quantum physics, that you wonder why this freedom movement has have come to a halt because you're demonizing the very people that the movement has been situated through. It makes no sense. That's called plantation psychosis. The belief that you're free when you're not because you are being counterintuitive to freedom movement. Um, so in that sense, so, so that, so that's that. Why it's important though, this all black lives matters. It's not the same when white folks say all lives matter. It's not the same. And don't let black people can't let them off the hook when they say that's the same thing. No, it's not. But what it is saying is that how do we say that black lives matters when there's been no critique, when black trans women continue to be beat and brutalized and murdered in in monumental ways, right? The question then asked, the question that's being asked, who lies matters most in Black Lives Matters? And the challenge for us to have this discussion is because Black trans women are being beat and brutalized by mostly Black cisgender men. And we have to sit with that. We have to be uncomfortable. So the all Black Lives Matters, it's not in again in the same realm when white folks say all lives matters, but it's offered as a critique who are you talking to, boo? Who are you talking about, boo? Not when you don't show up here when, when Shantae LaBeja gets beat and brutalized as a black trans woman, but she shows up there when Jamal gets beat and brutalized. Uh, Malik, did you wanna ask a question or? Yeah, I, I really hate to interrupt the, the flow you guys have, the, the way you're going back and forth, but there is a part of your TED Talk, which was amazing, and a conversation you had with the Journal for, um, uh, I think it was Art and Feminist Thought, um, where you talk about a radical pedagogy around performance. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the way performance, uh, what performance does and how it, you, what you described it as providing a hermeneutics, right? A way of interpreting um, and transforming understanding. You know, if, if you watch in a real simple way, uh, if, if you've watched, I don't know if you watch RuPaul's Drag Race. Um, and one in one way is I lift him up for being able to 
put that in sort of the, the, the public realm in that kind of way. But also there's a critique that has to be made because it's usually uh, performed through a white queer lens. That when I was younger, the drag, lipstick performance, we called it drag performance only because again, we didn't have the language trans. And so we called trans women at the time drag queens. And these lip sync performers were mostly always on a Sunday. That's not accidental, or it's not accidental on a Sunday because it became the space for church for us, the same day that we were ostracized out of church. And so here is this trans woman performing. Hermeneutics is nothing but theological word that how one reads text. But here's a text of black joy in conversation with black pain, right? The desire of imagining one's hope as I was just in conversation with my great, my daughter, Jennifer Lee and Robert Simba, that says to imagine that you are to live the next day is radical as a black trans woman. The next day is radical, right? So to interpret that in this performance is a hermeneutics, but it's also a homiletics and homiletics is nothing but a theological word that means how one ministers was ministry. So the same way when I went to church on Sundays, not to necessarily hear the minister, but to hear the black woman with a big voice sing, Black woman, again, the hermeneutics of a whole community, it's joy, it's pain. It's the same way I went to see this Black trans woman, but it's also a way of ministry. But here becomes the what I call the, the, the dialectic problematic, right? Here is in the space of freedom, becomes in many ways the, the space of her continued brutalization. Because as Black men, we lifted her up for the spectacle. But when the lights went down, we were not interested in her full humanity. So she had to leave off stage and probably try to get on the, the, the train to go home. And we weren't interested in how she got home. We're only interested. And so for, 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 for that though, that's a radical thing. It's un, but the radical thing could lend to your own demise, right? That, that, that it's radical to give yourself a service. Um, but oftentimes for particular black women, both trans and cisgender, lend to your own demise. You know, you think about um, black women who've given their, I've just talked about Janet Jackson, but you think about Josephine Baker, and you think about uh, uh, Nina Simone, whose voice changed when she gave her voice over to the freedom movement. It shifted, it got hoarse. Um, it's the same thing for black trans women. And so, uh, and so that, that for me, is, is what it is. Now, I'm, I'm gonna place this conversation because I, I remember some of my, my colleagues who are white feminists and they had a great critique uh, using Judith Butler's critique around uh, um, trans women, particularly in Paris is burning, reducing cisgender women to notions of hyper femininity. And there's some truth in that, right? The only way you perform femaleness was hyperly feminine. And there's some truth to that. But one of the things I suggest is that that's an antiquated critique to some degree. One, when I talk about this notion of YouTube and social media, where now Black trans women are being, uh, uh, are, are being seen now, and it's shifting the landscape of what it means to be a woman, um, and two around survival. So I'll go first to the landscape, what it means to be a woman. Where you're having celebrities who have Black and Latino gay men hairdressers, hair, uh, um, makeup artists, choreographers, producers, bringing these videos, these YouTube videos, to these cisgender women performers. And then you see these performers performing black trans women and you think it's a reverse. So when you see Beyonce do that, that, that that's Leomi. It's not Beyonce, she saw Leomi's video. Uh, when you look at a lot of the black reality TV shows, a lot of the black women are dressed now like black trans women from the houseball community. The way that oftentimes now black women in entertainment, even in, on social media uh, uh, and, and, and becoming Instagram models are shifting their body formulation, small waist getting pumped. That is oftentimes, that is through looking at these black trans women. But I'll, let me go to the space of survival. Great friend of colleague, uh, Barcelona, Spain, who at what one point was Beatrice Preciado, but now it's Paul Preciado. Brilliant, absolutely brilliant. And we were having this conversation around that critique and that she said, she said, uh, she used a different word after that, that, and she's white. And she said, because one of the things that they're not taking into account that because of transphobia, the thing that's most accessible to trans women for the economic viability of sex work this notion of realness, of performing hyperfemininity 
is in relationship to that. I then say, if you're in New York City and you're on the train, there's no train conductor that says, next stop, Transville, and you get off. You live in real communities, right? And so the walking down the street is about survival. So hyper notions of femininity is so important to survival, right? The last thing I'll say that, say about this, my great friend, I don't know if you watched the show Pose. So my great friend, Dominic Jackson is one of the stars of the show. Um, she plays Electra on Pose. And she's always had critique of this category in ballroom that we call trans women femme queens. That's what we call trans women in the ballroom community. She said, I am not a femme queen. You know, I'm a trans woman, blah, blah, blah. And, and I oftentimes say, well, there, a, there is a politics in being called a femme queen. And oftentimes the critique is that these femme queens have bodies that are sort of disfigured, if you will, you know, big hips, big breasts, that outs them in some ways and they're not trying to blend. And I said, that's the, that's the political response to them. That in some ways, yes, they're responding to gay men's uh, pressure around this is what a woman's supposed to look like. So that, that is true. At the same time, they're also saying to society, I'm not that what you call a man. I was assigned that at birth. And I'm not trying to be that what you think a woman is. What you see, I've created. And that's radical. So. Professor Crawford, you want to follow up there? Yeah, definitely. Uh, something I guess we can just jump into, how is it working as a consultant for Pose, right? And dealing with notions of authenticity and keeping it like historically accurate and telling the stories in a way that, that doesn't, I guess, create more spectatorship, right? I, so I was a consultant first season and the next two seasons we'll talk about why that happened. Mm -hmm. They kept us around so we could play so we used to be part. So I played judge on the second season and the season as well. But how this absolutely happened, my, my beloved child, uh, Twiggy Poochie Garcon, um, was the first one in many ways. I remember when it was communication put on social media. I'm only on Facebook. Uh, and I read that read about uh, Brian Murphy going to do this show. And there was critique. Here we are again, a queer white man telling the stories of, of queer folks of color. Um, and Stephen Canals, is an, who is an Afro-Latino gay man from the Bronx in LA, he created it. I mean, it's really his creation and it finally got to Ryan Murphy. I mean, folks still was like, I understand that but folks, there needs to be folks in the community involved. Twiggy, through a director named Silas Howard, a white trans man, um, was able to have conversation with Ryan Murphy and his team. Tanasi Papa worked for Ryan Murphy as well. So that's who she had a conversation with. And so Twiggy came to me and said, Father, I want you to help me create a, an, an agenda. I said, an agenda for what? Twiggy said, I have a meeting with Ryan Murphy. So I was like, oh my God. And so I wish you could be in this meeting. And I said, um, I would love to. Well, the meeting's going to be in Los Angeles and, I'll, and, and I'm already going to be in Los Angeles. See, I said, well, see if I can be Skyped in. So Twiggy wrote this wonderful email and asked, could I be Skyped in? I'm a ballroom historian, a, a, a Twiggy's manager and all this other stuff. And they said, no. Um, but they said, Ryan Murphy will be in New York City the next month. He would love to meet with you. Um, and so we did. And our meeting was supposed to be from 5 to 5.30. And it wound up being from 5 to 6.30. And I was in surprise a lot. And Twiggy had, so he gave me, uh, for, forewarned me about this. You know, in the meeting, he talked about he wanted to give up his salary to give to organizations, 10 particular ones that were doing work around particularly trans-led organizations. And we began to talk historicize the just, just like in this dialogue. And in that moment, he says to me, you know what I want to do? I want to put you and Twiggy as consultants and be in our writer's room. Now, you know, you think that's Hollywood just hyping you up. I'm like, oh, okay. So the other thing I pushed was that uh, the, the the possibility of getting ballroom folk not in front of the camera but behind the camera so not being a spectacle but being able to create apprenticeship to tell stories blah blah, blah. and he loved it i'll make this story short i went to law i went to toronto for some work two weeks later i got my passport pickpocket that stayed for three extra days he had said to me if i know of any folks who he thought that could be part of the show he wanted to do non-traditional casting and while I was in Toronto, I sent in some people, uh, emails of some people. I got back 
and I got a message saying I had this contract with, with Fox. I was a no man. The following week, the big casting agency called me and said, Ryan Murphy said, we should take you out to dinner and have a conversation. And I went and her name is Alexa. And one of the things she said to me, she said, you know, I have Oscars, she said, I have Emmys. She said, I don't work with people, but talking to you, I see why Ryan Murphy wants me to work with you. Um, and I thought it was in there, I promise you. Then he, we get an email, me and Twiggy, and asked us to be in Los Angeles for a month. I can only do it for two weeks. Twiggy was there for two weeks, September of 2017. I was there for two weeks in August, 2017. And I worked in, in Ryan Murphy's uh, 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 studio on the Fox lot with Janet Mock, with Stephen Canal, with Our Lady J and Ryan Murphy, helping to conceptualize the episodes. Um, and that is what they wanted. They wanted it to keep it as authentic as possible. I um, mean, then I came back and we 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 did some cultural, uh, 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 um, some cultural ballroom stuff, lectures with the 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 the, uh, the directors, the production heads, um, and then we we did the the background casting and the more. And I give all this story the context to say that, that he continued to push and push for us to be that much more included. We wind up getting my daughter, Genovia Chase is a black trans woman to do sort of an apprentice, started working there. Now she's full time with them. Had a black trans man named Seven King, who is a independent filmmaker, part of our own community to do an apprenticeship with Ryan Murphy. I mean, and, and, and we got more consultants on this show. That is not to say that they're still, it's not yours. And I had to realize it is utterly not mine and had to let go of some expectations. But I think that he is doing, they're doing a pretty good and an amazing job. It hired, it hired that first year more trans people, whether through the apprenticeship, whether through background, whether as the, the main cast than any combined community-based organizations combined in the history of community-based organizations. Um, and so in that sense, it's done an absolutely great job. The last thing I say is that one of the things people said about Ryan Murphy, that he has always been great in supporting women and women directors and women um, artists. And so that has always been his thing. So. I, I wanted to chime in and, and ask, um, my area is children and youth. Okay. And I'm particularly interested in Black youth who um, are alienated in institutions for their sexuality and for being um, trans or emerging as trans, whatever, wherever they are in that uh, trajectory. Um, and I'm wondering what kind of kinship or what kind of um, belonging um, the ballroom community is engaging in for those, for the youth. Well, to, to, that's a wonderful point. First of all, I love your language, emerging. Right. I love that. Um, first and foremost, when one looks at the history of house ball community, in many ways, it arises out of that space, right? The, the construction of houses arise, emerges out of that space. And we have, in our retro, in our romantic retrospection, we make these folks older than they were. But the folks who created these houses were very young, very, very young. Right. And so, you know, and particularly in the 70s. And so that is where it emerged from people being ostracized out of their homes, but not only ostracized out of your home, you're talking about community being ostracized out of Black community and having to create spaces of home. Some folks having to stay with folks, large numbers of homelessness. When you look at in New York City, I believe that 20% or 30% of the homeless population in New York City are LGBT young folk. Most of them are of color and largely a lot of them are in a house ball community, but how we define homeless has shifted because initially for a long time we defined homelessness around if you had no home to live in and so you were on the street or the shelter. And we've expanded it to talk about people who may be living on, from couch to couch. Right, have no place to live at all. And their survival is living from, from couch to couch. And in many ways having to engage in sex work as it relate to that. Um, so that's number one. The houses in many ways serve, serve as that space. The other thing too is that there is a younger, if you will, segment of the house wall community called the Kiki theme. 
And it was created first as an intervention at Gay Men's Health Crisis by a, my daughter, who is a cisgender black lesbian named Aisha. And she worked for the House of Latex Project. And initially they just wanted to create an intervention where all these young folk from the house wall community were coming in their organization needing services. And, but they were not necessarily in dialogue with one another because of house affiliation. So she said, how can I break this barrier down? And you would, for instance, say it was all five of us and we were in this space and you would just create a, a kiki house. She said, oh, this is the house of bottle and this is my child. And they would do that and have these sort of fun sort of competitions. You couldn't walk the competition. You couldn't walk in the category you walked in a ball. And it really created this camaraderie, but then it became real, right? And it became a scene. Um, and so now you're seeing in sit just like the houseball community, this migration of this younger scene. Part of their critique is that the older scene or the main scene, the sort of power that plays in the main scene that's ostracized out young folk. Some of that is around the critique of sexual um, predator stuff that's happening in the houseball community with young folk. Um, but a lot of it is also that a lot of these, uh, uh, the, the Kiki scene is tied to community-based organizations. So these organizations, particularly in New York City, are providing services for some of these young folk. And some of those services is around uh, uh, homelessness and issues, um, issues like that, food instability. But when I moved to New York City in 1999, I began working for Hetrick Martin Institute which is a multi-service uh, organization that provides a whole bunch of services for LGBT young folk. And one of the things it had was a Harvey Milk School. And at the time, the Harvey Milk School was the only um, pu sanctioned LG public school for LGBT young folk. Um, and, and things have began to shift in relationship to that and, it, it, and its success. Um, so New York, in some ways, operates in a bubble in a lot of ways. And we don't necessarily get it. We take it for granted. Um, and you and you begin to see, you, we still see folks migrating to New York City because they've been kicked out of their homes because of, of both homophobia and transphobia. And, um, and so finding themselves in New York City in, in the houseball community, but oftentimes sometimes ill-prepared and ill-equipped to deal with what it means to live in New York City. Um, and so that, that being the case, the last thing I'll say, is I have a great colleague of mine, black trans woman named Ayana Elliott. And Ayana lives in Los Angeles now. She's from Washington, DC. And Ayana began in the houseball community around 1995, 1996. And Ayana tells a story in many ways, to your point, was ostracized in some ways or systematically pushed out of school because of homophobia emerging as a trans folk and, and had to sleep on people's couches and made a choice to go to Job Corps to get her GED. But then she pushes herself, oh, if I got my GED, I could do better than that. She went and got her associate. She's oh, if I could get my associates, I could do better than that. She went and got her bachelor's, oh, if I could, I could do better than that. Winds up getting a master's and then her PhD. All while walking balls and being the mother of the House of Khan in Washington, D.C. And then Ayana does trans health, right? Um, but as someone, I should talk about it, didn't take her in, she didn't sleep on somebody's couch. And then say, I can do better than that. This me sleeping on this couch, yes, it is because of, but it won't be my future. It won't, and so, so yeah. That's amazing. Um, so thank you so much. We've gone over time because, and we could do this. Yeah, we, I, would, I would just like to do this for the rest of the day. Uh, but thank you so much for spending time with us and talking to us. Professor Crawford, uh, Professor Christianakis, if you want to say anything as we leave here. Just thank you. I, thank you for all of your work. Yes. Thank you. And I, I'm putting out in the universe that when, when things open up that way, I need to be there with you all. So we're putting that in the universe because I absolutely, absolutely brilliantly love this conversation. So thank you all. Yes. I uh, just did want to say that somebody did wish you a happy birthday or belated birthday. How did you know it was my birthday? How did I know that? Because <laughs> you said uh, Pisces Aquarius. Cousin. I am a Pisces Aquarius. So whoever <laughs> did it, thank you so very much. My birthday was last Friday. I turned a certain age uh -huh. um, and blessed to be here. So thank you so very much. But Professor Crawford, I love that language, Professor Crawford. I also want to appreciate you 
in your persistence in having this, especially in this moment and what it means, but also uh, on a personal note, just very, and don't know you well, but just so very proud Thank of you. how you're holding space. Um, you know, just keep doing that and what you're doing. Thank you, I appreciate that. You're very welcome. Yes. So uh, I would just say as we leave that uh, Professor Madison Moore from uh, Virginia Commonwealth University will be here uh, next Thursday at 12 p.m. to talk about uh, Black Queer Dreaming. That's the title of the talk. Um, so we're very lucky to have Professor Crawford, not only because of brilliance and everything else, but because uh, bringing the amazing people like you, Professor Moore, together. So thank you so much. Um, and I guess we'll say goodbye. All right. Y'all have an absolutely blessed rest of your week. All right. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye. <laughs>